My name is David DePew. I uh, am an emeritus professor in communication studies um, at the University of Iowa. And um, I also was appointed in the uh, project on the rhetoric of inquiry at Iowa. So. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of your most recent research in the area of rhetoric of science, technology, yeah. and medicine? Um, the area I do research in is um, uh, evolutionary theory. Uh, specifically Darwinian evolutionary theory, even more specifically population genetical Darwinian evolutionary theory. Um, I was practicing in that field um, as a philosopher of um, science and as a historian of science before I became a rhetorician of science. And uh, that occurred in when I moved to the University of Iowa from um, Cal State Fullerton um, in 1996, and um, uh, I found that that was a really congenial atmosphere um, in which to develop rhetoric of um, evolutionary biology. Um, the field had actually been pioneered, as I said yesterday, by John Angus Campbell, but he was working pretty much on 19th century Darwinism and public controversies that resulted from that. But his way of analyzing texts, I, 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 I did a lot. So I, um, but my, my interest and uh, work is pretty much centered on um, population genetical revolution of the 20th century, which is the, the, the kind of Darwinism that um, is called scientific Darwinism. Um, well, completely freed it from um, um, the um, uh, bad things that were said about Darwinism at the end of the 19th century and that still continue to circulate in the society. But it was, in my view, it was unable to be uh, absorbed into the social discourse. So you have <laughs> a kind of a huge uh, tension. Uh, there's been many, many controversies uh, ever since. So again, the controversies are the unit. I'm currently writing a book with John Jackson of the University of uh, Colorado Communication Studies, a historian. Um, um, of um, scientific racism in the United States. And we're writing a book on the mutual influence of uh, genetic Darwinism and um, cultural anthropology, which is, uh, as I was bending here last night, of extreme interest, right? And uh, I'm trying to explain uh, why it is that in 1974, when you had so-called so sociobiology, behavior genetics, and now you have evolutionary psychology, um, uh, why uh, initially what looked like saw a very, very small change caused this huge disruption uh, in the, com in the uh, community of um, evolutionary biologists. The, the uh, people from the classical view of the modern synthesis completely rejected that, um, um, especially like people like Richard Lewinton. Um, and, uh, uh, accused uh, the people who held it of everything from genetic determinism to racism to eugenics. How did this excessive reaction take place? Well, it's easy how see how it took place. Uh, what that did was it weakened the concept of the, cult, the Boazian culture concept, which, as you know, is one of the great organizing um, um, uh, 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 signifiers of 20th century academia. It's a, uh, it, it weakened it. Uh, and, and the result was, in the opinion of its op opponents, uh, allowed uh, these old 19th century um, uh, bugaboos uh, to c come back in, racism, eugenics, and, and things like that. And we've been, so this is a kind of rhetorical analysis of something that I don't think people have done before, um, and that's why I'm excited about it. So you characterize yourself as starting out as a historian and philosopher of science, yeah. but then um, you you fell under the spell of rhetoric? Yeah, you, pretty much. And why now, was that? What drew you well, into? Well, first of all, I did have some background in rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And I was hired at the University of Iowa in rhetoric because I did have background. And I was at the University of Chicago in the late 60s. I, I, I studied rhetoric. I taught a course. Unlike most philosophers, I knew a fair amount about, about rhetoric, classical rhetoric. I didn't know all the modern contemporary stuff. But I learned it quickly enough by being at the University of Iowa, very, very exciting department. And uh, then it took me a while to realize that I could start casting my own history and philosophy stuff in that, in that idiom. It, had, it took me a long time to kind of find my voice about that. But I think I found it now. Yeah. Yeah. So rhetoric of, import, of science is very important to me. When I came to Iowa, uh, John Lyne 
who was one of the founders of Arst. Um, he and I had taught uh, uh, courses um, at Iowa when he was a chair of the department and I was an adjunct, I was a trailing spouse. My wife got a job there <laughs> um, in classics. And uh, John and I started teaching together. John and I had become friends. John went to Pittsburgh. Um, I stayed at Iowa. Um, and uh, um, so I think it was probably through John and then my um, um, Darwinian connection to John Angus Campbell, who was also one of the founders that got me involved in ours. Another thing that happened was that a year after I came there, they had decided in comp studies um, to sort of expand in the area of rhetoric of science. And they, they hired a young woman named Joanna Plager. And Joanna Plager got very involved in ours as a junior professor. She actually became president. I cannot remember what year that was. Um, so she was involved in, in, the in the 90s, late, the late 90s, right? Very, very, uh, there's a lot of people that you'll be talking to who knew her, right? And then unfortunately she uh, died. She died of cancer um, um, in the mid 2000s. And it was a, so the department decided uh, that they were not going to pursue um, rhetoric of science anymore after uh, Joanna. And uh, um, so I began to work more and more sort of by myself, really, in a way. But I, I taught a course in rhetoric of science uh, in Poroi and in Com Studies, graduate class in rhetoric of science. I taught it up until last year. Very, very satisfying graduate course in it. And, you know, learned a lot more through teaching. Can you tell me uh, a little more about the history of ARST and your involvement? Yeah, with it? well, I think I've already said what it was. I think it mm -hmm. was this per personal thing through a line, Campbell, and Joanna. And anything they wanted me to do, I did. I did not ever become an officer, but I was always constantly pumping graduate students into it. If Joanna wanted me to read manuscripts or do this hard stuff you do, uh, go to the business meeting, um, uh, keep, keep the wheels turning, I was, I was generally there in the background since about 96. So um, I think of, the, especially since yesterday, I think of, I do think the institution went through a fair amount of soul searching about what it wanted its mission to be, what its kind of common language was going to be, and I didn't notice any of that yesterday. I think that that was like settled. Other people commented on this. And the issue was, you know, how you get bigger and how you get your word out and how you affect the world. I thought that was a really um, a kind of sign of a maturing of the, uh, of the whole program. And uh, of course, I've known Lisa Karenin for a long time, too. Right, and uh, really, really I'm glad to see her um, uh, so active in this. There's another aspect too, the pro Project on the Rhetoric of Inquiry started out as a sort of a faculty um, group, but then developed a graduate program, a graduate certificate program at the University of Iowa, um, which basically uh, applied rhetorical criticism to science, right? Uh, it it kind of was, a, an ideal program in a way, um, and um, got some dissertations out of it uh, from people who were my, uh, my, my, so McLean Watson was original, was involved in this for a while. He ran the website, right, until fairly recently. Um, he, he, he wrote a really, really fine dissertation in rhetoric of science, rhetoric of neuroplasticity discourse. Very, very nice piece of work. Um, Rachel Whitten was my student, she teaches in She's, she's been involved, she, she, she works on uh, um, basically history of pseudoscience and junk science. <laughs> and she's just kind of fascinated by little things like that, like this, everybody going nuts about vaccines and stuff. She gets into that stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. What are, can you share with us some memorable moments from past RCS? Yeah, I, I thought about that, I saw that question. One of them is um, when I was on the program committee I guess so, or deputed by it to put together the pre-conference um, uh, with Joan Leach and Lisa Karenin on this keywords project. So I, I was very, very much involved in getting the keywords project going and I've kept on working on it. Uh, I, I, uh, it did not result in a publication. We did have uh, the three of us. Leach, I did not know what year this was. I'm guessing 2005, six. We had a consultation with Strata Publishers. She, the lady was really ready to go. And then she came back six months uh, later and said, 
well, we did a market analysis. We don't think there's a big enough market, which shows the basic problem we got. It's size. <laughs> Scale is our, is our problem, I think. Uh, we need to ramp up somehow, I think. Uh, but then I noticed yesterday we had a conversation about putting it online. One of the things that's happened, of course, is that digital technology and digital ability to consume, not just to disseminate, but to actually consume, has really um, fulfilled all the prophecies that were given about what would happen. Um, we were noticing, somebody mentioned yesterday, that rhetoric of science papers that are being published in Poroi, the journal that I help edit, um, 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 where ARS, every year, ARS puts the results of its um, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, pre-conference summaries of it, pre-season online in the journal, so it becomes a kind of medium for discussion among us. So we have a, a, we have a kind of presence in rhetoric of science publication, and somebody said yesterday, Linda Walsh, uh, but other people have said it too, I've noticed that Sometimes you just knock yourself out of some book paper for a year that shows up in some volume, and then it's gone, right? You write some little thing in rhetoric of science, you put it up on that thing, and there's nothing but hits, right? I mean, clearly the media environment is changing. And uh, if you want my advice, I suppose they're about where to go, right? I really think we need to really, really ramp that up, the digital presence of it. I also think we need to go international. One of, a number of interviewees have mentioned the Gamkar affair oh, um, as a yeah. memorable moment. I, that's correct. Um, that's interesting. Another. Oh, let me just mention a couple others. Um, um, I hadn't realized until I heard that conversation yesterday how difficult the Gamkar thing was for people. Like Larry Prelly was really upset by it. Didn't know that. Um, uh, I, I remember following it. Um, and that uh, <coughs> didn't have that huge effect on me. I was going to keep doing ethos, pathos, and logos, no matter if Dilip said that it was, you know, not a good thing. I, I kept on doing it. And then you can, I mean, I tell people who teach the, take the Poroi classes in rhetoric of inquiry and rhetoric of science, hey, you know, ethos, pathos, logos, et cetera. Hey, you can also compose a lot of good music in the key of D. I mean, this is <laughs> <laughs> Oh, by the way, Leah Ceccarelli's work has had a big influence on me. She writes the same stuff, fields I do. Notice, notice what Leah does. Have you ever read Leah? Ethos, pathos, logo. She, she does not push the envelope on this either. She, you know, it's... I, I think that I took that as a kind of a model. I think that she's been very successful by uh, not being overly theoretical. Uh, I think of other things that made an impression on me, not at pre-conferences especially. One of them was the Sokol controversy. Another was our friend Steve Fuller. Steve Fuller is a guy I've known even from before I came here, and he has a radically social constructionist view of science. He, he tries to be to the left of Paul Feyerabend. Um And he testified um, on the creationist side in the uh, Dover trial. Right, an, an account, by the way, of which of his testimony, if you know Steve, he's sort of like very expressive. Um, there's an account in the New Yorker by one of the New Yorker's really, really good writers of Steve on the stand in, in Dover, where the, he, he's like me. He, the judge asked him a simple question. Pretty soon you're just off on this kind of rhapsody, and the judge is calling him back, and then he, the judge says, judge says, okay, it's time for a recess. And he looks over to Steve, who's sitting in the witness box, says, for you, decaf. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think this was serious business. That I, I believe that whatever year that was, we had a pre-conference, wasn't all that long ago, um, five years maybe, four. Uh, the issue was floating around the room of, um, gee, do we really want to be in the name of rhetoric on the side of sort of under, uh, undermining the epistemic authority of science. And I think that the answer, and it was certainly confirmed by the conversation, was no, <laughs> absolutely not. And that was very clear in what Celeste Kahn said, right? And I, I think that is a consensus. We want to work within, within that. Um, Steve would be very welcome to be 
back in the group, um, or in the group. I think he has been here once or twice. But uh, I believe that that was a very crucial moment. I mean, there was a... So th they were even so like, gee, maybe we ought to go back to logical empiricism. At least we wouldn't be undermining uh, science. We don't want to have created a discipline that undermines the very thing that we're um, interested in thinking of. So I, I think that was a crucial little path in the road. Yeah. And I think the Sokol controversy was similar. Was there a pre-conference organized around No, that? it was just in the background what people were... Um, thinking about it. And I think that, at least in my mind, it was like, look, we're not doing literary studies. <laughs> we're not doing philosophy of science. That I know. I know how to tell those differences. But we're also not just doing literary studies, right? So a lot of that stuff about social text and all that, that was literary studies of, of a certain kind. So I think it was a kind of occasion to figure out the little path that we have, which I think is a very, very important path. And, you know, you don't have to be in rhetoric of science to do good rhetoric of science. Um, um, I don't know if you ever read in my, in my field, um, Evelyn Fox Keller. Uh, Evelyn Fox Keller writes these little books on concepts like the gene, genetic determinism, um, genotype, phenotype relation. They're, they're sort of technical, right? They, if you read them, they are all rhetorical analysis, right? And they're as good or better than most of us are doing. And then she takes on metaphors. She knows that there are some cases where metaphors work, some cases where metaphors don't. You, your job is to figure out when the metaphor is facilitating an epistemic function, when it is blocking it. Uh, you could have the same metaphor that performs a f positive function at one point, becomes a barrier at another, Right, well, that that's that's the kind of stuff that I that I track in the um, history of um, evolutionary rhetoric. So it is the twenty year anniversary of Arst. Um, looking back at the last twenty years, what significant tensions or intellectual sticking points would you identify? Well, I think that we're pretty tolerant of our differences. Somebody said yesterday, we're some of us are working um, really in public rhetorics. Lots of people, right? And that's great. But there's some of us that work on epistemic rhetorics. That is, the rhetorics are going on inside of fields or between one technical sphere and another. I don't see much tension between us. Uh, I do see the difference. But uh, unless somebody else, I, I don't see any particular problem about that. I think they could be um, very, very mutually illuminating. I guess I do have a bugaboo that I think that people ought to really know the technical science. Um, so he agrees with me. He studies ecology, right? Yeah. That's one uh, thing a number of people have said. Is, is one of the biggest challenges um, for a rhetorical science, especially early on, was that you had to master a technical field um, as well as um, you know learn a, a rhetorical sensibility. Correct. Um, Gee, where are you going to do all that, right? Right. What are, what are other challenges? Well, a, a good, a good um, mentor uh, will, 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 will shift you in that direction. Um, uh, or you can kind of take advantage of it. They do that at Pitt regularly. Um, my student, uh, former student, McLean Watson, who worked on neuroplasticity, and rhetoric, like the general idea was great. I mean, first of all, the the archive you used was ads in magazines and all kinds of little fragments that you see that are floating around free discourse, where you used to have this idea of genetic determinism, which meant you and your family and your grandmother and you're not going to be able to do anything other than you're you're preordained, right? And you say, oh well, then then let's let's uh, say uh, you have neuroplasticity. That's free. For everything would you can get whatever you want. But the problem is, if you don't play Mozart to your kid, your kid's neurons aren't going to hook up and people are out there buying all kinds of toys and making their kids listen to Mozart at the age of two. So there's a, it, it produces just an, another version of the same kind of anxiety. right? And he, he analyzed the rhetoric of that kind of anxiety of, and, the, and the way the ads were like pitching it. <laughs> yeah. What do you see as some of the biggest challenges facing? Why, we, why Mozart would hook your neurons better, say, than the Rolling Stones, I really don't know. But 
<laughs> More research is needed. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but I wanted Anyway, to I wanted to say that McLean took about four courses in developmental psychology at the University of Iowa in order to do this. So, I mean, you, if you're in a good university program, you probably would have the resources to do it. I think it would be unwise for, if, a, if there isn't any technical knowledge in the stuff that you're doing, you, it would be unwise not to go learn it. Are there other challenges besides the, the technical ones? Well, I, 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 some of this might be local, but I, I think that each department, first of all, having a single rhetorician of science in a comprehensive rhetoric program is often seen as a big deal, like you're not going to get two. And so you generally tend to be fairly isolated, and it would, be, it would have been a lot better for me if John Line had stayed at Iowa, then Joanna came, you would have had a kind of critical mass. The programs that are doing well do have a critical mass. Uh, Georgia, uh, Celeste has, uh, Tom Lessel, other people that have, that's, that's got a presence there, Pitt. I always wish Iowa could have had it. We gave it a shot, and, but the, it wasn't in the cards. But you do, and Colorado is, now, now Colorado, if you include Boulder and Denver. <laughs> um, so I don't know what other sites are, but you got to have a critical mass of people. Producing, I mean, I was involved in a field, philosophy of biology, that oh, in the very beginning, this field began in 1981, around this controversy about sociobiology. Uh, I grew up with that field. So they started a little organization similar to ours, International Society for the History and Philosophy of Biology, uh, which went international within about 10 years. It meets every two years, freestanding meetings. Um, kind of all over the world. The next meetings are in Montpellier, France. Um, the last ones a year ago were in uh, Utah. That's not odd because the University of Utah is one of the genome um, 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 mapping and sequencing sites in the United States. That's not odd either because they had Mormon pedigrees to work on. <laughs> um, um, and I believe there's probably uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 members of that organization. Uh, they don't have a journal of their own, but there are two or three journals in the field that serve as uh, journals of record for it. Um, I, I'm, I guess my ideal is I don't see why we couldn't slowly find, go, I go down and find out how you do that, <laughs> how you go from one level up to the next. And I do know the people who really nurtured it in the way that the people I've mentioned nurtured Arst. Dick Berrien and other people, they were just in it year after year and slogging and then it, it, it had takeoff. It got, it got big. It's now worldwide. So I was thinking, especially when the Finnish woman was there yesterday, well, why not? Let's, we could be international. It turns out there's a kind of hunger for this. So that's what I would hope we would do. So can you, talk, you talked a little bit about your recent research. Um, can you identify what you think is your biggest contribution? to the field of rhetoric of science? Either a, a theory or a concept or a publication? Well, I, I, I did not invent new methods. I'm a key D guy. My, my primary audience has not actually been in our field. My primary audience has been historians and philosophers of biology and scientists. Most of the stuff I write is for them. So th there's an issue that came up yesterday. Um, I wrote a paper, it's a kind of a follow-up of a paper that John Angus Campbell wrote called The Rhetoric of Darwin's Origin that was published in a Cambridge book um, on Darwin's um, rhetoric. Uh, it's called the uh, Cambridge Companion to Darwin's Origin. Um, you know, they were in 19, uh, at the, on the, on the, on the, on the uh, 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth. 150th anniversary of um, uh, publication of The Origin a couple of years ago, 2009, people were publishing all these books, right? <laughs> um, um, I wrote a paper in there that's called The Rhetoric of Darwin's Origin, of the Origin of Species. It, it is a straightforward arst slash pori kind of analysis of the argument um, um, in the book. It's been very well received by, by, by people who write me about it. Uh, then. 
um, I was asked to write a paper for a conference last year in Vienna, uh, which was about the role of theory in evolutionary biology. And they actually gave me the title. They also gave you a free ride down the Danube, by the way, which was not blue. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, they gave me the title, The Rhetoric, they'd read the other paper, The Rhetoric of Evolutionary Theory. And I have that paper uh, published in a journal, there, a journal, European journal called um, Biological Theory. The, I, I, I think it was a successful piece. It was a straightforward ethos, pathos, logos. Um, and, uh, it was not a reduction to social context or any of it was not. It was really epistemic rhetoric, right? I, I, I remember the people thinking, that's pretty suspicious. <laughs> um, I, I, I thought I had a kind of a hard time getting it across. Um, but um, that's what I've done. I've, I've tried to um, say, hey, you see these techniques? This is going to help in your field. Secondly, I think that they have a problem. I think that philosophers of biology, um, especially, um, um, for instance, say, oh, biology is a technical field. Uh, you learn biology, but you don't understand, for instance, how biology was connected to social theory. You realize that in the old days, in the 19th century, it was basically driven by. <laughs> and then when the real biology comes along um, in the 20th century, you basically don't see how important the social um, stuff was in the formation of the actual science itself. That is not something they want to hear. Um, that's the kind of work that I'm doing now. So that uh, I do think that the, the concern for um, deconstruct the concept of race and have uh, e Bo Boazian equality of cultures was deeply, deeply involved, not as an application only of population genetics. It went into the core making of population genetics. I can prove that from the archives. So, so one uh, frustration I think that's often voiced um, at parse meeting and by rhetoricians of science is that we're not taken seriously. By well, that's a problem. And yeah, I'm trying to. It seems like you're you're a model of success. I, well, I don't know how much it's getting across, but I do think that I've worked at it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, what? So, do you have a, a more specific strategy there that besides just just well, never, to use the, lo the lowest and smallest um, meta-theoretical structure, you're not going to tell them any post-structuralism. You're not going to tell them anything like that. So you, using this um, language that's the ethos, pathos, logos, um, mythos, um, um, topos, stay like concepts you can, everybody can master like in five minutes. And then, this came up yesterday, by the way, uh, at the meeting, absolutely right. So you have to, remember the argument yesterday about should we keep the R word or should we replace it with argumentation or whatever, remember that? Okay. Um, if you use, the, 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 the inference I got from that is if you keep the R word, first thing you do when you write is, here is what I don't mean by rhetoric. <laughs> here is what I do mean. And every single one of these papers, the two that I told you about in particular, the 19th century application of it to Darwin, himself, and then the 20th century expansion of it to, um, uh, to, 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 to 20th century evolutionary, which I wouldn't have written about except they said we want you to write about it. Um, um, uh, the, 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 you, 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 I, I just, every, both of them, I just began with, there's three kinds of rhetoric. The first kind is what you probably mean by rhetoric, it's what I call trickle-down rhetoric. You have some, what you take to be literal claim, and then you say, for the idiots out there, Here's a good metaphor. <laughs> okay, physicists, by the way, have, they're forced to do that to some extent because the concepts are so mathematical. Um, here's another kind of rhetoric, expressive rhetoric. Darwin was an expressive rhetoric. Go read John Angus Campbell. It's a kind of romantic movement, right? It's n n not unlike Humboldt. The idea is that if you feel about nature a certain way, nature will reveal its secrets. And then by what uh, the poet um, Wordsworth says as an um, overflow of your feelings into words, you will then express nature's secret. When Darwin was young, he believed that. Here, here's my, what I mean by argument. Argumentative argument, argumentative rhetoric. 
This is where you um, say you have addressed speech in a controversy to which you are uh, making a, 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 a motion to, to, to resolve the controversy. So that before you talk about context independent things, you have to relocate everything in the context in which it originally had any meaning or mostly its evidence is restricted to the, to the context in which it started. It, the evidence might then bear on something else. Um, so in, in all of my work, even prior work with uh, Bruce Weber and Marjorie Green, who were my, my friends and mentors, so some people say, oh, I'm a Darwinian. I say, what do you mean by that? I said, I, I've studied this now long. I could name at least 20 different kinds of Darwinians, right? Um, you, each one of which is controversy specific. And so I, I guess reliving the past that way uh, in some kind of clarity without a lot of theoretical superstructure is a way of um, getting people to n not be, well, is for a controversy to satiate. That is to really know what you're talking about. I think most of the controversies you hear about evolution now are not even real controversies. They're just free-floating terms that uh, are just sort of out there. Um, um, the real story is much more interesting. So uh, um, I, I, I do, uh, that's, that's what I kind of do. I actually started publishing a year ago, two years ago, in a journal called Science and Education, which is a very, very good journal um, on um, pedagogical aspects of uh, teaching evolution which I've never really tried to do, but um, I, I have been trying to bring these messages to. Um, I, I read one textbook, the most widely selling textbook in the United States at the college level, which is trained uh, pre-med students. So these are biology, well, fairly serious. Um, when you go to the sections on evolution and that, it's a mess. So yeah, I wouldn't just blame, <laughs> I, I wouldn't just blame um, uh, either bad teachers or um, uh, students for, um, I, I, and nobody could pick up a coherent view of evolutionary theory from a book like that. It was written by a committee. It's a mess. So, I mean, I, I think that I, I had a little bit of a controversy when I first came to Iowa with uh, my colleagues in Poroi uh, who um, basically wanted to give, they gave the impression that they wanted um, sciences to redefine themselves as rhetorical. Um, so Deirdre McCluskey wrote this book on the rhetoric of economics in which she, well, makes economic. So I don't think that's a fair case because I think rhetoric is Tom Goodnight and everybody, Tom David Hinksman, that rhetoric is, <laughs> economics is rhetorical. <laughs> um, but if you start uh, uh, asking me to go over and tell uh, a physicist or a chemist or a biologist, hey, you ought to rhetorize what you're doing, I'm thinking, I don't think I want to try that. <laughs> uh, it's not just because it wouldn't succeed. It's just that I'm not sure that's true. In other words, it might be a reflective uh, enterprise, like I see philosophy of uh, science as. I do see it as kind of a rival of philosophy of science for explaining all the stuff about how science relates to society. Yeah. That's what I do see. So you talked a, a bit about um, internet, the, the internet's yes. role in rhetoric of science. You talked about the potential for internationalization. Yeah. Um, do you want to expand on either of those? Or well, it was a kind of a gleam in my eye. Directions. I haven't thought about it. It's a, I'll put it down as a future direction. I really wouldn't know exactly how to do it, but I, I don't see why it couldn't be done. Are there other future directions you would sort of articulate other exigencies, topics, or methods that you might uh, point to I as see. a future for rhetoric of science? Well, I'm, as you can see, I, in terms of the meta theory, of, uh, I stayed very, very simple because I'm dealing with audiences or fields that uh, are rhetoric resistant. So you, I, I, I've never developed um, or even sought to develop all new methods of analysis. I've just used these very simple tools. And I, I'm, I'm afraid I've just been limited by that. Uh, that um, other people's problems would require all kinds of different things, right? But I, I'm, I'm just conscious of the deal about, um, you've got a very fragile audience there with very high epistemic authority, right? And you're, um, I, I, I tend to be very cautious about this. Our last question. Um, is do you have any advice 
for young scholars in the field, uh, graduate students um, or? Well, I would like to turn the journal that I'm co-editing, the electronic journal, Poroi, which already Arst has a presence in, in, I said this yesterday too, send something to us. I now edited a lot of these papers, send them, people send them over, and the ones that are science I read, okay? Uh, often people are isolated, they've never written a journal. We used, for 20 years I taught a course there, writing for learned journals, it's one of the most successful courses at Iowa. Uh, a lot of people are writing in um, uh, universities or colleges where they really want to do rhetoric of science or uh, science related studies. They, they've never been, they don't know enough experience about um, what the norms are of how to get an article published, what the appropriate arguments are, et cetera, et cetera. What, what they would get from doing the journal, and in fact we could even put this in the institution itself, is a, a lot of feedback on how to do this. So that you notice that um, we are getting a lot of articles published. But uh, I, I, I would think that we ought to try to get more and more, um, not just publications, but a practice of, um, of criticism that results in publication. And then you can get these things published in something like Poroi, but then since you hold the copyright, you get more and more feedback, the paper will rewrite itself, then you send it to QJS or Rhetoric and Public Affairs or whatever. I mean, it's, you, you've got to see this as a multi-stage um, thing. You just can't say, oh, that's an interesting my paper, a student gave me an A, I think I'll write it up and send it to QJS. The chances of that working are real low. <laughs> So I think we ought to develop a young generation um, of grad students who, and there's plenty of them, and either on the public side of our work or the so-called epistemic side or both, are really wanting to go into this. And I think we need to find a way as an institution to, to nurture that community. That, when I think about it, is how this International Society for the History of Philosophy and Biology did. They nurtured their young. So the, there's a very interesting thing that people had noticed. Um, in, in their every, 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 they have meetings in the summer, everybody wears shorts, there's no hierarchy. So the students are, there's no hierarchy because it's not connected to a, you know, like a discipline and a university system, job market, anything like that. So it's extremely egalitarian and very empowering of the young and that's, that's how that worked. That's how that was a success. So are you recommending we start wearing shorts at the ARST pre-conferences? Uh, yeah. I think, I wonder if we could, um, I don't know, we'd have to get a grant at our center, workshop in the summer, um, something along those lines. We have to start finding a funding source too. How are we going to do that? <laughs>